this is Philip Blackwell, pastor of the Bible Baptist Church in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And we're glad that you've tuned in today to one of our Bible messages. The sermon that you're about to hear was preached behind the pulpit of our church at one of our regularly scheduled services. We pray that the Lord speaks to your heart as you listen.
Now, whose responsibility is it to control the attitude of the airplane? The pilot. Let me ask you a question. Whose responsibility is it to control your attitude? Oh, we can blame the wife. <laughs> the kids. Yep. The bad dog. Right. But the truth is, it comes right back to us, doesn't it? Right. It's our attitude. It's our spirit. Now, there's a lot of people that have a bad attitude. Yeah. And they, wherever you work, if you're not careful, that bad attitude can affect you. And I've, I've seen preachers that got a bad attitude about something. It wasn't long they weren't in the ministry. Yeah. Isn't that what the devil wants? I mean, the importance of your attitude. Now, we used to have a neighbor named Mr. Cattlechick, and it's kind of funny, and it's sad in a way, but it's also funny. We like to ask Mr. Cattlechick how he was doing, because he always said the same thing. Uh, we'd say, hi, Mr. Cattlechick, how are you today? Terrible! <laughs> well, serious, that's what he said every time he shakes his head. <laughs> now, when we went to Bible college, we read a book by Charles Tremendous Jones and asked Mr. Jones, how are you doing today? And he said, Tremendous! <laughs> now, what would you rather read? Terrible or Tremendous? You know, the choice is up to you. Yeah. Well, you don't know my circumstances. Well, what about Paul and Silas when they were beat up and whipped for leading a lady to Christ and put in jail and at midnight they were singing and praising God and got God's attention. He shook the prison. They could have got free, and the janitor comes to him and says, Boys, whatever you got, I need. What must I do to be saved? That's right. You know, we'd see more people saved if we were rejoicing and praising God. You know, John 40, verse 1 and 3 says, He brought us up out of a horrible pit and set our feet upon a solid rock and established our goings and put a new song Amen. in our mouth. Even Amen. praise Amen. to our God. Maybe she'll see it in fear and she'll trust in the Lord. You know, the Bible does say rejoice evermore. <laughs> the Bible says in everything give thanks. Right. You know, the Bible talks to us about having the right spirit and the right attitude and how important it is. Now, you might say of Daniel here, well, yeah, if I was at the top, I could have the right spirit and the right attitude too. Well, you know, Daniel had his problem. I mean, if you read history, somewhere in the 605, 606 B.C., the Babylonians came in and killed everybody and took a few people like Daniel back as prisoners to Babylon. See, what happened to Daniel's brothers and sisters? What happened to Daniel's mom and dad? What happened to Daniel's grandma, grandpa, or uncle, friend? We don't know, but it's very likely they were killed. That's right. And Daniel was taken as a slave, a captive, back to Babylon. Not only that, but they made him a eunuch, which means he's never going to father children, he's never going to marry. Not only that, but he interprets the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar and saves all the wise men's lives. And what did they do in this chapter? They lied about him and had him thrown in the lion's den. Right. He talked about getting stabbed in the back, <laughs> criticized and rejected by your peers. Daniel had it. Right. And yet the Bible says Daniel had an excellent spirit Amen. in all of it. Now, how did he do that? That's a good question, isn't it? I mean, how is it that Daniel had an excellent spirit and he rose to the top with the Babylonian Empire and then when the Babylonians fell and the medio persians took over, here in chapter 6, he rises to the top again. You young people, you know, God is looking uh, for people with a good spirit and attitude to bless and to use. And even people of the world, like Nebuchadnezzar or or Darius here are looking for people to promote that have a good spirit and to have a good attitude. Amen. To be teachable, as the pastor was talking about earlier. And to be willing to listen. And to be willing to follow. And to do what you're told or what God would, would have us to do. Right. The first thing that I see about Daniel that caused Daniel to have an excellent spirit is found in chapter 1. Let's see Daniel's purpose. Look at Daniel chapter 1. Daniel purposed not to defile himself. Daniel purposed in his heart to live a holy life. Daniel purposed to do right. God wants us to be do-righters. 
Amen? God wants us to do that which is right and pleasing in his sight. And even though Daniel was uprooted in another country, and he could have said, well, when in Rome, you know, do as the Romans do. He didn't say that. He said, no, I'm one of God's children. Amen. I'm not going to buy myself and eat and drink and do what they're doing. Right. By the way, if you eat the world's food and drink the world's things, you're going to have all the judgments and the curses of the world, too. I love Brother Roloff. He used to help food. Not that one, too. I'm not going to preach about that this morning, but mm -hmm. I did have some coffee this morning, so you're leading me astray. <laughs> <laughs> Now look at chapter 1 and verse 5. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. The first thing, if we're going to have a right attitude, we have to purpose in our heart. You have to purpose to have the right attitude. Now let me ask you a question. Be honest with me. Okay. Sometimes it's hard to get Christians to be honest. <laughs> Hello. Be honest with me. Now, if somebody comes up to you and says, how are you today? What do you normally say? Well, there are people say, I'm fine, I'm pretty good, not too bad. You know, people answer all kinds of ways. All right? My goal in this message today is to get you to raise one notch wherever you're at. I'm not asking you to go from terrible to tremendous. <laughs> okay, I'm just asking you to raise one notch from where you're at. Let's say you say pretty good. Why don't you just start saying when somebody asks you, why don't you raise it one notch and say wonderful? I'm not asking you to say tremendous! <laughs> I just said wonderful. You know at work tomorrow, if somebody asks you how you're doing, and you said wonderful, you know what they would probably say back? They'd be shocked because you said wonderful, number one. Number two, they would probably say, well, what's so wonderful about it? You got an open opportunity to witness. Amen. They ask you, <laughs> and you can give a witness for Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, do you ever hear the story about the parrot and the turkey? Anybody ever hear the story of the parrot and the turkey? Oh, yeah. oh I see. <laughs> <Great story. laughs> it's a great story. You're going to love the story. This guy named John was given this several thousand dollar parrot. And after he got the parrot, he found out why they gave him the parrot. Because the parrot was mean and nasty. The parrot would swear and say nasty things. And the guy thought, what am I going to do? I mean, these are nice people and friends that gave me this expensive parrot. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change the attitude of that parrot. So you know what he did? He started playing nice Christian music and everything. That parrot was still mean and nasty. And so then he would speak real nice and courteous and be real kind to the parrot. The parrot was still mean and nasty. But one day he lost his patience and got mad. <laughs> Yelled at the parrot! Told the parrot off. And the parrot just swore at him and carried on. So he opened that cage and grabbed that stinking parrot. Went over to the fridge freezer, opened the freezer, and threw that parrot in there and slammed the door. That parrot swore and hollered and carried and flopping around in there. Served that little devil right, you know. And, and he was standing there for a while. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, you know, started convicting him. Said, you know, you just lost your testimony to that parrot. And uh, he said, you know, I'm going to have to apologize to that parrot. And when you lose your testimony, what do you got to do? You got to apologize. Say, I'm sorry. <coughs> I was wrong. You know, even your kids sometimes, you, you know, as parents, we have we make mistakes and, and we have to apologize, right? I grabbed up the wrong kid and gave him a licking and later, later on found out, whoops, I spanked the wrong one. You know? <laughs> what do you do? So you got to go and apologize. And I assumed it was Gary because he was always the bad one, but sometimes the other ones are bad. <laughs> well, anyway, he said, I've got to apologize to this parrot. So he went over to the freezer and opened the door and grabbed that parrot, pulled him out, was just about to apologize when the parrot said, I am so, so sorry. He said, please forgive me. He said, I know my language has offended you, and I'm going to change my spirit and my attitude. Please just give me one more chance. And the man was taken back, and he thought, just about to say, well, what, what was it, you know, that changed your attitude? And with his wing, he pointed over to the preacher and said, might I ask you a question? 
He said, uh, what does a turkey do? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to get eaten like that turkey, you know. You can change your attitude and your spirit with God's help. Amen. You could increase it and have a better spirit and a better attitude. Now, Daniel purposed in his heart that he'd not defile himself. The reason he purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself is because sin brings sorrow. Sin brings shame. Sin brings discouragement. Sin brings conviction and, and regret and, and guilt. And he said, I, I, I want to have the right kind of spirit. I want to have God's spirit. I want to please God. And so he purposed not to defile himself. How many of you like to go to the dentist? Does anybody like to go to the dentist? That's not my favorite place. I've got an implant here. I've got some teeth missing. You know, I've got some problems with the motorcycle. And I asked Amy earlier if she would be willing to be, help me with an illustration. She so gracefully told me she wouldn't. Oh, she said she would. <laughs> and uh, you know what this is, Amy? Dental floss. Did you ever go to the dentist? Did they ever take this and floss your teeth? Why do they do that? To get the junk out of there, right? Oh, do you trust me to floss your teeth? I've never flossed any teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost my own. Now, let me tell you something. Wouldn't it be something if you could take this floss and use it to get the junk out of your head? Huh? Because you know the devil's told you a lot of lies. If you're not careful, the only power that the devil has over you is lies. He tells you a lie about God. Has God said? Didn't God say you could eat of all the fruit? Or none of the fruit? You know, he, he, he twists it. The devil is always trying to tell us a lie about the pastor or about somebody else. If he can get you to believe a lie and get you upset or get you mad, get influence in your life, then he is happy. That's why the Bible says we're going to buy the truth and sell it not. That's why the Bible says... We're to love the truth. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And we keep, have to keep coming to the Bible so God can <laughs> blow the kinks out of our head and get the junk out of our head and to hold on to the truth and what, what is right. As a pastor, I've had people come to my office and they're mad and upset about things, you know, and said, well, we're, we're leaving the church. I said, well, why are you leaving the church? Well, we're just not getting fed here. I said, well, there's 300 and something folks out there that are getting fed and growing. Let me ask you a question. I said, how much of the Bible are you reading during the week? Well, we're busy. You know, we work hard. Oh, wait just a minute. You're telling me the reason you're leaving the church is because you're not getting fed. And I pray and try to preach the word and I try to be filled with the spirit and I try to deliver a biblical Bible message with full of truth and doctrine. You're telling me you're not getting fed. You know why you're not getting fed? Because you didn't come hungry. I mean, if you don't get something out of it, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with God, His Word, the Holy Spirit. Now, I have a patent. It's a, it's a pending patent, uh, Pastor. But I have a patent on some sweet spirit prayer. And as soon as I get that baby patent, if somebody comes in your office like that, you just get this. Uh, <laughs> oh, Pastor, we love you. <laughs> You're the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm telling you, we just get so much out of your sermons. And we thank God. How many think that you would be in the market for some sweet spirit? Right? <laughs> huh? You know, some of you like to give a squirt. You know? <laughs> Are they in this room? No, don't raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> No, the, the truth is, all of us need a shot of that every once in a while. Amen? And Daniel, he purposed in his heart. Now, secondly, I want you to notice back in Daniel chapter 6, not only did Daniel purpose in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself, but Daniel knew something about prayer. Daniel was a man of prayer. You know, God has given us a spiritual weapon called prayer, where we can go to him in prayer. And, uh, and Daniel knew that those other guys had a thing signed that you couldn't go and get a petition from anybody or ask anything other than the king. But he went and prayed anyway because he knew God commanded him to. We ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. And so Daniel in chapter 6 and verse 10, Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went into his house 
his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He, he didn't forgot where, he never forgot where he came from. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel knew how to take his burdens to the Lord. If you stop thinking about your troubles and your problems yeah. all the time and give them to the Lord, you'd see your spirit pick up. Amen. Daniel had a lot of troubles and problems and burdens too, as we all do. Yeah. But Daniel knew something about take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Huh? Well, we take our burden to the Lord, but then we pick it back up and take it with us. Right. Yeah? Leave it with the Lord. Take your problem to the Lord. There's things that we can't change. There's things that we can't do anything about. It. And uh, we need help. And so take your problem to God in prayer and leave it with him. Rather than being all frustrated and bent out of shape and upset about something, say, I've got to take my burden to the Lord. Leave it here. Amen. You know, Peter walked on the water <laughs> with Jesus till he got his eyes off and started looking at his problems, and then he went down, didn't he? And by the way, he didn't pray a long prayer. Oh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, he had a ground. He just said, Lord, save me. And me. Right. The Lord took him by hand and lifted him out. As soon as you start feeling your spirit slipping, as soon as you start feeling that temperature coming up, by the way, you know, losing your temper is a bad testimony. Yeah. Amen. If you men towards your wife, that is not romantic. Yep. Uh, Amen. The, you know, it's always right to be kind. Amen. Be kind one to another. Not only that, but tender hearted, full of love. Forgiving one another. You know, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to have to forgive one another because sometimes we step on each other's toes. Sometimes we forget things or say things we shouldn't. Yeah. And we have to seek forgiveness. You know, I've known good people in a good church that let some little bitty thing get under their craw and the first thing you know, they're bad to leave the church. Yep. If you're going to stay in any relationship, you're going to have to learn to forgive. Amen? <laughs> the Lord Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, if the Lord can forgive us for all that we've done, we surely can forgive others. And by the way, you need forgiveness. Amen? And so we have to forgive so that we can be forgiven. So Daniel prayed and Daniel took his burden to the Lord. Daniel purposed. I'd like you to look back in the Old Testament with me for just a moment. Go back to the book of Numbers. Did you ever read about the children of Israel there in Numbers 11 and how Everywhere they went, they seemed to complain and gripe about things. Do you remember the reading there? They murmured against Moses. They murmured and complained against God. And they complained about this. They complained. Wasn't, weren't they slaves a little while ago in Egypt, being beaten and working day and night? And now God's feeding them with heavenly manna, and they're free, and, and God has got a pillar of fire by night, keeping them warm, and God's got a a pillar of cloud by day to keep the sun from burning them, and God helped their clothes so they wouldn't wear out. And I mean, God was giving them a leader, and God was leading them to the promised land. But the Bible says in Numbers 11 and verse 1, and when the people complained, they're supposed to be rejoicing. We're talking about having a good spirit. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. Now, I could go to chapter 12, verse 1, 14, 2, 16, 3, 16, 41, 17, 5, 17, 10, 20, verse 1 through 3, and see time after time where God's people were complaining and griping instead of rejoicing. I thought, man, those people were complaining people. Not like me. Not like you. Huh? If you had a recorder around your neck, do you have more rejoicing or more complaining? You know, if you're not careful, we complain about the weather, we complain about this, you, you know, you listen to the news, that's no good, you, you turn off that stupid thing. I mean, all, first thing you know, we're down in the dumps because we just, all our problems and all, hey, folks, we got it good. We got food to eat, you know, we've got clothes to wear. 
I mean, I've been to Cuba and South America and Costa Rica and the Philippines and other places where people are poor and don't have anything. And you know what? Most of those Christians are so happy in the Lord and rejoicing and praising God, it puts us to shame. Which ought to bring conviction to our heart. Daniel, he had an excellent spirit. I like your memory verse. He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. You need to memorize that verse. There's a verse right across the page in chapter 18 that says something about having the right kind of spirit too. 1814, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmities. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmities. See, if you have problems in your life and you have a good spirit, your spirit will sustain your weakness. Your spirit will help you even though you're having problems. But if you have a bad attitude and a problem comes in your life, then what do you do? Well, right. people go to alcohol, drugs, suicide, all kinds of things. Because they had a bad attitude and a bad spirit in the first place. So purpose in your heart to have a better attitude. Take your attitude in your life to God in prayer. Thirdly, why did Daniel have an excellent spirit? Look at Daniel chapter 5, and verse number 11. There is a man in the kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. They said, we know a man that has the Holy Spirit. He has the spirit of the gods in him. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit has come in. Is that right? Isn't that what Roman 8 teaches in other places? Yeah. If the Holy Spirit's in and we're, we're uh, complaining and griping and having a bad attitude, that is grieving the Spirit. We're, we ought to be rejoicing. What is the Spirit of God supposed to bring in your life? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance. I missed one. I think God most of them. But anyway, the importance of having the Spirit. Now look what it says in verse 12. For an excellent Spirit is in it. Look at chapter, uh, verse 14, excuse me. I even, I have even read of thee that the Spirit I have even heard of thee, excuse me, that the spirit of the gods is in me. So Daniel was known for a man that I believe had the spirit of God on his life, and in his life, the Old Testament. But uh, Daniel knew something about the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit's power to help us to have the right spirit. Right. We need the Holy Spirit's fullness that we might have the right spirit. You're not spirit-filled when you have the wrong attitude or the wrong spirit. We need Christians that have an excellent spirit, a good spirit. I look at, look at Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, now this is something we really don't want to hear. When the pastor's taking us out to a nice restaurant to eat. How many of you like to eat? Yeah, most of us like to eat. How many of you like to fast? You know, my wife and I started a habit years ago of fasting one day a week. And you know, fasting is good for you, by the way, if you read Isaiah 58 and other places. Didn't Jesus say to the disciples, this kind come forth by nothing but feasting? So prayer and fasting. Moses fasted. He's a pretty great man in the Bible. Huh? Elijah fasted. Jesus fasted. You're a pretty good company if you fast. I'm not talking about fasting 40 days. I'm just talking about missing a meal or fasting for 24 hours and saying no to self and no to the flesh and no to your will and saying yes to God and fill me with your spirit and being burdened for revival and praying for your country and thinking about a soul that needs to be saved and getting your mind off yourself and on other people. And notice what it says in chapter 10 and verse 12. Daniel had been praying, and God had sent an answer, but a demon stopped the holy messenger, and they fought in the heavens for 21 days. You read the passage yourself. Do you know there's demonic powers? Do you know that we're in a battle? We're in a spiritual warfare. And finally, Michael comes down and whips up on this demon, so the messenger is able to get to Daniel. 
Now notice verse 12 of chapter 10. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself, that's fasting, before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king Kings of, and, and remained there with the king, kings of Persia. And now God's going to tell him about the future and, and give him some prophetic things. But that was because that Daniel prayed and fasted. We need some people that are willing to set aside a meal and get serious about revival and souls being saved. You know, our country's going down the tubes in a hurry. When the older generation dies and these young people take over, that want communism, where our country's going to be in a mess. And I see churches are that way. I go and preach in a lot of churches, and 75% of the people are my age or older. Well, when the old people die, and that's why 4,000 churches a week are closing, a year, excuse me, in the United States. 150,000 people a week quit going to church, and 4,000 churches in America will close this year. We're in a downward spiral. It's time for God's people to say, you know, I need to have an excellent spirit so I can be used of God to win people to Christ. I got a lot of message yet that I haven't got to because I'm long-winded. But I want <coughs> you to turn with me, if you would, to Philippians, the book all about re rejoicing. And uh, in Philippians, God gives us a great verse. Chapter 4, verse 8. Many of you haven't memorized. I memorized it years ago. I'm talking to you about your spirit and your attitude. I'm not saying you have a bad, nasty spirit like the parrot. But I'm saying we need to improve our spirit. We need to have a better spirit than what we have. How do we do that? Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, what sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? There be any virtue and there be any praise? Thank God these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Here's the blessing of it. And the God of peace shall be with you. How many of you want God to be with you? Yeah. We want him to be with us, though. Then we need to have the right spirit. Do you like to be around people that have a bad attitude? Huh? I mean, if you get around people with a bad attitude, first thing you know, they pull you down. God likes to be around people that have the right spirit. God says, I'll be with you. I'm glad you have the right spirit. Spirit of faith. Spirit of expecting God to do great things. Spirit of God and believing God wants to work in your life. <clears throat> God says in verse 10 there, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly, Paul says. And now at the last, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lack opportunity. Let me say something to you. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. I've met so many people over the years that got a bad attitude, and first thing you know, they're not serving God. They got a bad attitude at their job. They quit a good job because they got a bad attitude. The devil wants you to have the wrong spirit. God wants you to have a spirit like Daniel. A good spirit. Would you stand please? Your head bowed, your eyes closed. We're going to have an invitation.